Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Nashers 360 Speaker Series. I'm Linda Wilbur, and today I'm pleased to introduce Bosco Sodi. As an educator at the Nasher, I've had the pleasure of teaching with Bosco Sodi's Muro, a recent acquisition to our collection. Made of clay timbers that were used in a performative installation and then dispersed to viewers and collectors, Muro has been a wonderful way to share with our visitors how sculpture can create community and commonality, even in times of division. Sodi draws much from his work on the raw elements of earth and transforms these materials into physical objects that become both poetic and minimal capturing the essential character of these elements and transcending them to express conceptual ideas. Sodi's work has been featured in solo exhibitions at a variety of museums in Europe, Japan, and North America, including the Bronx Museum, New York, 2010, Museo de Arte de Ponce, Puerto Rico, 2012, and most recently, the Museo Nacional de Arte and the Museo Anahuacai in Mexico City, 2017. His work is in the collection of notable museums, such as the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut, the Museum of Contemporary Art, San Diego, the Harvard Art Museums, Cambridge, Massachusetts, the New Orleans Museum of Art, the Des Moines Art Center, and the Colección Humex, Mexico City. The artist currently lives and works in New York, Barcelona, Berlin, Mexico City, and Oaxaca. We are so pleased to have the opportunity for the artist to share his work with all of you today. Please join me now in welcoming Bosco Sodi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to come to Dallas, to the Nasher, that is a museum that I love. So thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Um, I'm going to begin uh, explaining a little bit about, about my work and my process and my philosophy. And then we can do some uh, questions and answers. Uh, um, so I'm going to be passing some videos and images just for you. In the meantime, I'm going to be talking. I think the images are more interesting, but anyway. So I, I have always been considered, um, I mean, there is a big debate of if I'm a painter or, or a sculptor. Um, the reason is because I always work just with the hands, and I work with a lot of texture, and, and, uh, and I like the materiality of the objects, and uh, so my paintings, they're very sculptorical, very um, physical. They're, I, I like them to be called objects more than, than paintings. And they are inspired in the, in the Estelas, I mean, in, in, the, in the, 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 the Mayans or the Aztecs, they have these interpretations of, of, of gods or, or, or objects made in these stones that we call Estelas in, 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 in Mexico. I don't know if it's the same way here, yes. So I like a lot the physicality of the Estelas. And when I was young, and my mother and my father, they, they took us a lot of, a lot of different architectural, uh, sorry, pre-Hispanic places. Um, and so I, I think I have a big influence from that. So I like to, to work a, a, with a stretcher in horizontal, and I begin to do this mixture of uh, sawdust with the pigments, and I begin to add it with my hands and playing with the pigments and the water, as you can see in the video, always looking and embracing the accident, the non-control, the organicness of, of the sawdust, and um, and based on one philosophy that I learned since I was very young uh, through a friend of mine that actually he became a very successful movie director, that's Alejandro González Iñárritu. He was a big follower of the wabi-sabi philosophy. And he introduced me to the wabi-sabi philosophy, aesthetic philosophy. That is a philosophy from Japan that talks how the accident, the non-control, the impredictability of things, the patina, the passing of time, it's what makes things unique and special. Um, I, I have always believed that things, that they have a formula and that you know the outcome or they're, or they're very industrial. 
they're boring because it's, it, you will have always the same uh, effect. So as, as you can see, when I, when, I, when I mix, I try to mix with any formula, I, I add pigment without measuring the, the, the weight or, or, or use the sodos that can be very different uh, uh, depending on the kind of wood that, uh, of the tree that it, it comes from. And always embracing chance and accident. I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm known for this series of painting with a lot of texture and cracks, but I, I begin to do those paintings as an accident. I went to an exhibition of, uh, of Brack uh, 25 years ago at the Reina Sofia in, in not the Reina Sofia, the Thyssen Boreniz, Boreniza in, in, in Madrid. And when I was reading about, about Brack, I, uh, they said that Bragg, in order to give it some texture to his paintings, he had uh, sawdust. So then I said, why? Why don't, why don't, why don't I, I don't begin to add sawdust to, to, the, to, to the acrylic? And I was doing these paintings with texture and, and uh, color, but very, uh, say, with not, with not, 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 so not so strong with the texture. And then one day when I was leaving the, the studio, I dropped a bucket full of this material, and I came three days later, and it was completely full of cracks and everything, and, and I, I find that the idea was very interesting, and then I, I begin to try to develop that idea that, I, that I'm still doing and developing. But as you can see, the, 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 the process is, is, is very physical. I love the exchange of energy. I believe in the exchange of energy between the artist and, and, the, and, the, and the subject, and the, and the piece. Um, I respect my colleagues that they have assistants or, or they do it in a very technical way, but I, I, I believe in this kind of energy. I, I believe that the, when you see a Picasso, when you see an ARP, you feel the hands of the, of the, of, of, of the artist. And it has this special energy. I believe in the exchange of energy and that it, it, it stays sealed in the, in the atoms of, of the piece. So I like to do, do I, I, I enjoy to do that. I, I don't work with assistants. I just, I, I like to stretch the canvas myself. I like to, to, to prepare the painting myself uh, and do the whole process. In this case, I had some assistance because it's, as you can see, it's a very big piece that I did for the Bronx Museum. And, um, and I needed help to, to move it. But you can see how, how it's completely, uh, it's, of course, it has a lot of relationship with the, abstract expressionist and the action, action painting, but in a different way, also looking for the texture and not just for the, for the movement of the colors. And it's, uh, it's a fun, fun work to, to do because uh, you never know what is, how the painting is gonna uh, take, you know? So I, I, I work for long on the painting, but then when I see the first crack, I mean, when the, when the painting is, becoming alive by, by himself, I stop immediately and I let the painting go by himself. Uh, to give you an example, uh, one interesting example, it's a few years ago I was doing uh, a, a, a red painting for a commission for the La Cruz family. And when I finished, it was the last day of the, of the summer before the summer break. And I was with my family and, and then I, I, I finished the painting and I saw it and said, wow, it's, it's a very bad painting, I should destroy it. But my kids, they wanted to go, and w next day we were going for vacation, said, no, please, please leave it this way. And, and when we come back, you destroy it uh, in, in, in September. And then when I came back, the painting was so beautiful, crack, and so exceptional that I keep it, and it's one of my best paintings. So that shows how few control do I have on the painting. I can choose the color, of course, I can choose the size of the stretcher, but then how, how it's going to react and everything is, is by his own mean. And I think that's what it makes them to look so natural and sometimes so earthy and, and not, non, not made by humans. Uh, um, the, 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 the process of the adding the water and adding the pigments, they begin to mix each other without uh, any, any preconceived idea. So you can see it's, it's fun to make them, no? And this, the, this painting, it also happened as an accident because at that time, Holly Block, that was the director of the Bronx Museum, that sadly, she passed away. 
Um, he came to visit my studio, I think it was 2010 or something like that. She loved the, the work and she told me, I would like to make a, a show with you in 2020. I said, well, I was amazed and I was grateful. But it was like six years later or five years, I don't remember what, how it was. And then she called me like three months later and she told me, Bosco, there is this slot that it just opened because uh, one artist canceled the exhibition, would you like it? And of course I said yes. And, 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 uh, and by an accident and by something that was part of the philosophy, I, I end doing this painting for the, for the Bronx Museum. But I, I love the, 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 to research, to, 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 to try to find a way to use the materials and to, to take them to, to extreme situations. So I begin to add much more and more, more material to the paintings until they became maybe uh, 10 inches thick. So I, I'm always looking for this kind of challenge uh, of, of, of the matter. I come from a family, my, my father is a chemical engineer, so I grew up uh, with experiments at home. Every day we were opening the fridge and there were experiments or there were fires. He was, <laughs> he was doing uh, the, the, the alcohol distillation and uh, any crazy idea. So I think from there comes my, my I mean, the, the, the way I like to research and to challenge uh, materiality. So here you can see the painting then at the Bronx Museum. It's a painting of four meters by 12 meters. And uh, it, 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 the name was Pangea because it, it uh, looks like this big part of the, of, in the world before the continents uh, split. You can see more, this is another big painting that I did uh, organic blue that I did for the Bronx Museum, sorry, for the Humex Foundation. Here you can see the scale of the painting. That was the show at the Bronx. And different uh, shows that I have done, but I wanted to show first to begin with the painting that was my, my early beginning. That was at the, uh, at the, when I was working with the Pace Gallery at the Ponce Museum. So you have uh, always looking for different colors, different, uh, the, the way I source the pigments is also, uh, every time I, I go to a, uh, to a place like Morocco or to India, I try to find these special pigments that uh, are unique. And I try to find them as much as possible to, to be organic in order that, that there is less control on the outcome of the, of the work. Um, this kind of sculpture is, I, I, I mean, everybody has done these sculptures on the beach when you begin to drop the, so what I did is also playing with chance and non-control. Um, I was taking the, the, the left of the paintings of each painting and drop it, drop it for one or two years until we, we did, when I did this, these kind of sculptures. That always, all of them, they're completely different because also it's, there is chance involved, non-control, and they're unique. And I believe of the, of the uniqueness of things. No, I believe on the uniqueness of life. I believe in, in, in the, the beauty on, of unpredictability of life. No, and at these times, and the new generations, I think they're looking much, for much more predictability, for more um, a planet outcome. No, and I think that's one of the beauties, beauties of life. And uh, it's to not know what's going to happen and the next day. No. So you can see them in different contexts. This is an Aguacali Museum. That is a museum of Diego Rivera in Mexico City. Actually, this show was curated by somebody that worked here for a long time, Daking Hart. This was on the, on the National Museum of Art in Mexico. That it's also, it was run by a, somebody that you all know very well, Agustin Arteaga, that managed the museum here in Dallas. So here we come to the second part. Uh, one day I was doing these ceramics in, in Guadalajara near Mexico, 
because this uh, brand of tequila Cuervo, they asked me to do decanters for, for them. And I put the condition that I will do the decanters just if they let me do each decanter completely different because I wanted each one to be unique. But in, in the meantime that you do the decanters and they dry and burn and everything, it's one week. So I didn't have to, anything to do. And I said to the, the owner of the, of the kiln, uh, of the ceramic factory, I said, what happened if we glaze a rock? He told me, no, it's impossible. It will blow up and destroy my, my kiln. So I began to research and then call the geologists in the University of Mexico the whole week because I didn't have anything to do, just drink and tequila and be. And then one day at the, and I was in the factory and, the, and this guy came selling uh, molcajetes. I don't know, molcajetes where we make the salts in Mexico. Murders. And, and the, the murder he was selling was made by volcanic rock. And then I got the idea, like say, why, why don't we put a volcanic rock if they, were, they are already curated at those temperatures? So I talked to the guy of the, of the, uh, the, guy of the factory, and he told me, I will let you do it if you get an insurance for my kill. <laughs> <laughs> I, I called my gallery, at that, at that time was Pace, and I told them, can you get me an insurance for the kill? We got an insurance for the kill. And then I went to the a volcano near Guadalajara, that the name is the Seboruco, and we went rock, rock hunting, I call it. So we went to this uh, volcano and we began to choose the rocks. But, but, I, but in the process, I, I like to, re, to, to have a respect and, and appreciation for the form that is already done in the rock. So we, we grabbed the rocks as, as, as the way they were. We just cleaned them. And we took them in a very rustic way because there are not uh, cranes or anything to take them like that with donkeys out from the, from the volcano. And then we begin to experiment. So we were measuring them and, and, uh, and uh, looking for the ones that didn't have a crack. And, uh, it's a very fun part because you go with, a, we were 10 or 16 people in order to carry them, bueno, to help the donkeys to carry them. But it's like really rock, rock hunting. Like, uh, I don't know if some of you have done mushroom hunting. This is very similar. You go there, you, you take it out from the, from the earth. If you don't like the form, you, I like to put it exactly the same way, like respecting their own being. And then we begin to glaze them. But in order to glaze them, something that is very interesting of the process of glaze is that glaze is white. So you don't know the color that, you, the color that you're applying. So it, it also brings another concept of, of non-control and unpredictability on the work. So when you do ceramics, and you, you can add color in order to know which color it is, but I, I love the exercise of adding some colors and trying to imagine how is the, the, the painting, because at the end I was painting the rocks, to imagine how, how is, it, it was uh, doing it, no? And then, um, well, well, we glazed them. That was the first time we did it. Then we put it in this huge kiln and we bring them up to 1,280 degrees. So it was a challenge. And what, the result? <laughs> okay, so we have to try it again. <laughs> and we keep trying and trying and trying until we'll begin to be successful. And uh, I mean, the one, this may be one of the happiest day. I, uh, after, after seeing born my three kids, and this was the fourth uh, happiest day. The moment you open the kiln, and this is a completely surprise, it's a, because you don't know what, 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 what happened with the colors or with the fire. In Mexico, they say that the fire is the one who decides the outcome of the ceramics or the, or, or, or the clay. So then we're analyzing the rocks, and then you, we, we, you, you take an object as simple as a rock, as common as a rock, and you, you transform it in an object of desire, in an object of beauty, in an object of, 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 uh, of holiness, in a way. So they have been installed in very different ways. And then I came with the idea, say, well, I would like to bring them and make them even more holy. So I wanted to glaze them with, with real gold. And after researching a lot, because it, uh, people told me, well, you should add um, a gold leaf, but I don't like that concept. I, I think it takes essence of the, pro of, of the process. And uh, we find this 
producer of gold uh, for glazing, real gold for glazing. And after making them on red, we begin to glaze them with seven carat real gold. And to make these really completely objects of desire, of uh, aesthetic beauty, or something as common as a rock. And then I begin to play with different ways of installing them with a, uh, in different, no, this is a gallery from Japan. In that case, what I did is, I did these lacquer paintings. We, I work with this uh, Japanese lacquer master that he did these lacquer panels for me that it, took, it takes him like eight or nine months to do the panels. And then I put matter on top. So also was an experiment because at the beginning, the first ones we made, all the material was coming out because the lac lacquer is so perfect that the, it, it didn't hold the material. So we, we, we needed to scratch the, 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 the work. And the, I had one of my worst allergies ever because the orushi is it's like the poison ivy. So I went to the hospital like for two days in Japan. Here you see them at the Noguchi Museum. This was an installation. I did this Zen garden in my gallery in London with uh, all the gold, uh, big gold rocks and small gold rocks. Then it came the second, the th one of other challenge. I always love the stone walls in the, in, the, um, in the countryside. I love how they are full of, of mud and, um, I mean, and nature. So I wanted to glaze one entire wall. And um, we, I, I uh, talked again to this factory owner. He told me it's going to be impossible. Uh, uh, I think that's one of the words I like the most. So then, that's why I say I have, we have to make it. And then we begin to do it uh, uh, until we were able to, to, to melt one. Because with the, with the glaze, the glaze work as an additive. Uh, adhesive, sorry. So they got together with the glaze. It's like this high and like 15 feet or something like that. And you see them in different contexts. This was also in the National Museum with a painting on, on the back. The Anahuacali Museum. My gallery from, uh, from Brazil, we put them in each uh, niche com surrounded by, 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 by plants. And it was really beautiful because you were able to see them from the both sides, from the niche. But in the, this installation was in order like, to make them organic, like if you were in the jungle and then you find this piece of gold in the middle of it. I mean, the, this, I mean maybe this has been the most traveled rocks in the world. This is coming in, in, in Japan, in Shanghai, then in Mexico. But look how beautiful it is, this with, with an old painting in the National Museum. We have, we have here another bit. OK. So then I, I have a foundation in Mexico named Casa Wabi that I will explain further, further later. But then one, one day I went with my, in the surroundings on the foundation, they do uh, clay bricks. And one day I took my kids to do clay with the guys who made the clay bricks. And when they were doing their figures, I did this small cube. And the guy of the, of the uh, Abel, that now he has become my studio assistant there, he told me, it seemed, I told him, what about if we, do, if we cook this clay? It was a very small cube. Eh? And he told me, it will be impossible. It will break. And then I said, well, let's try to make a big cube of uh, two feet by two, by two feet. And then he, you can see the process because it's beautiful. No? Uh, one of the beauty of, the, of clay that I was talking with you today and, and, and something I believe is that clay has been forever with humans. It has been our best friend since the very beginnings of civilization. Human maybe wouldn't be so advanced now if, if we didn't find the existence of clay. The first tools, the first uh, interpretation that men did, the uh, sculptural interpretation that men did, is with clay, and any civilization that can be called civilization, they have been involved with clay, no? So, so and, and one of the, of the beauties of clay's, clay is that it's made with the four elements. 
So in any, any piece of clay, you have the four ele elements involved, what makes it unique and uh, so connected to humans, no? It's very different. The, the water tastes different in a clay jar than in a glass jar or in a plastic glass jar, no? And I think it's because it's where, where we come from, no? The earth. So you can see the process is very elemental. He's Abel Degon, who works, helped me working. And we begin to experiment again. We make the cube. And why, why, why I choose to do, to do a cube? Because I thought it was very uh, interesting to come pr from such an abstract form as the clay, that when, when it's raw, as you can see, and to make a completely human form that is the, the cube. But we did, I didn't want to use a mold, because then it will be very predictable again. So we decided to, to make them by hand, the cube. So we cut them with a string and, and, and in a very rustic uh, way. And to, so we didn't know any, anything how to do it. And we begin to experiment since the very beginning, for example, to add uh, the dust in order that it doesn't got to stick to the, to the support. I mean, we, begin, we have to throw it very hard in order that there are no bubbles inside. The less bubbles, the, the less the probability of, of uh, uh, cracking in the, in the kiln. So you see, the, we're beginning to get a, 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 a very abstract form. And then we begin to cut with the hands and try to make a cube just with our hands. And then with the pieces of wood, we, we begin to cut. But this, this was, was uh, just by experimentation. I mean, non Abel, non myself, non, nobody knew, knew how to do it. And it's very interesting because I did a show this September uh, in a gallery in Belgium. And at the same time I was having the show, there was this uh, Japanese ceramist that name is Shishimura-san. That is from Japan. It's, it's the most important ceramist from Japan. He's a national treasury, living nat national treasury. Uh, we were staying together at the, uh, the uh, uh, well, uh, in, in, in Belgium. And then I, and, but we were talking and he knew my work, but he didn't see, see, the, see it alive. And the day of the opening, when he saw the cubes, he was like half an hour around the cube, like looking at it. And, and then he told me with his, his translator that it was not true, that those cubes were not made by, by that, that me, that we said, this is impossible to make. He told me, they are hollow. I said, no, 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 they're solid. And then uh, he, was, he couldn't believe it until he saw the video. He told me, I, I, I have been, there have been six generations of, of my family doing ceramics, and we, this is impossible. So I, like, I love this kind of challenge. I mean, my, my work goes about this challenge. It's what makes me alive, is to go and try to find a way to, to do it. And, uh, and after we have the cubes, then we have to let them dry for, uh, for some, some months in, in the shadows, and then let them dry in the sun. But at the beginning, they were cracking because we were thinking to the sun faster. So we, we begin to develop a formula, a for, a formula. And then the interesting thing is that we, 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 we construct a rustic kiln outside my studio. This is my studio uh, at Casa Wabi. And then we burn it with different kind of wood or coconut skin or jacaranda seeds and for different times in order to get these completely different textures and outcomes. So, in order that it doesn't become an industrial uh, process. So, as you can see, it's also very touchy, very physical, with a lot of connection to the material. So, we have to learn how to move them. We have to learn everything since the very beginning. No? This is the... the the, the, the kiln. But everything were a spontaneous idea that they, you know, we didn't know how to move. First, I bring my friends and say, look, there were a lot of friends of mine at, at, at the house, other times I bring them. And obviously, we could, not, we could not move it because it's 700 pounds. So then we have to, to find a, a forklift to help us. And we didn't know, I mean, we didn't have an idea how to cook them or, or, or how to make it. So you, we covered them with bricks in order to spread the, the heat. 
close the, the, the bricks with a, with mold, mold, sorry, with a fresh clay, sorry. We develop a cover to put up in order to maintain, to, to make it even uh, more strong, the heat. And we went with the coconut producers around to buy the coconut skin. And then you have to begin very slowly in order to be, that the heat shock is not very strong. Even the dogs were born. <laughs> but as you can see, it's a very essential process. Very, it can be done 300 years ago, 400 years ago. Two at a time. And I, I obviously, I mean, I, at the beginning, we didn't know that burning with different wood will, will bring different outcomes or different uh, uh, textures or colors on the, on, the, on, the, on the paint. So it's a day by day learning process, even now. And normally we burn for 12 or 16 hours. What is nice because you're seeing the stars, and it's like camping. Who doesn't love fire, no? It's like very animal, no? It's our connection with... Uh, so it comes, the, as I told you, the, the best day is the, the, the opening, because you don't have an idea of what is going to happen. And for example, here one, one, one was broken. And then I came with my... My biggest idea ever that I think I'm, someday I'm going to win the Nobel Prize in physics. But it's funny because when, when we install in, well, no, here in the United States or in Europe or wherever we install the cubes, the installers they cannot believe that this idea, that this is the most simple and stupid idea. So you're going to see it now. So in order to be able to take out the the hands of the, of the four clips, we put ice between the cubes. <laughs> we, we don't follow any safety, safety rule, of course. How do we take them out? <laughs> we have to push a little bit on the side in order to put the, the, the stripe. You see they have these beautiful crackings and the concept is for them to be, um, uh, with time, they will be, begin to be, not destroyed, but they will be changing. No? It's, it's a, a very nice idea and an interesting concept that I wrote, read, or I don't know, uh, on the Adriano Memoirs, I don't know, Memories of Adriano, a very beautiful book. And Adriano, that was one of the most important Roman emperors, he said that he built uh, Athens with white marble because of the light of Athens is very strong. But Rome, he built it with clay because he wanted that at the end of time, Rome to become a mountain again. 
So this concept of the cubes in, in exterior that sometimes is different, difficult for collectors to understand is that they're going to be uh, with the patina, they will become green and they, some of the corners will begin to round or how they say, uh, I mean, they, they will become more, much more organic shape, no? So you see them in different contexts. And then I glaze them with gold. And I like the idea of, of glazing them with gold because it put them in a completely different context. And they're here mixing with the, with the works in a dialogue. In the Nahuacali. But this one, come, I mean, at the end they become as paintings. No? If you see them, maybe they, they, they couldn't be Rodkos, no? The way they, yeah. but it's not made by me. Actually, for me, the best Richard Serra piece that there is, is the one that he transported during Irene, Irene uh, uh, Hurricane. The ones that they were showing at the Gagosha a long time ago, because they, were, they have a lot of the acidity of the rain in the pieces. And for me, they are the most beautiful ones of Richard Serra because of that accident. So that was the, my latest show with my New York Gallery with Paul Kasmin. And then, uh, this was in, in Berlin uh, a few months ago. And this, we, we did this bigger cube that is 80 by 80, that it's almost 3,000 pounds. <laughs> and we have done several of these ones, like three, four or five. Then I came with the idea that I wanted to do a solid one of two meters by two meters by two meters, 50,000 uh, pounds. And, and, uh, and um, so we, in our, we knew that we were not going to be able to move it. So we do the kiln under it. We cover it with sand. And we, be, we, we begin to do it by hand. But obviously, it was not possible. The, the cube will melt. Then we tried to put wood as, a, as a, to contain. And the wood was also getting round or, or bending. So then we do it with metal. But with metal, it didn't have enough uh, uh, air to, for the, to dry. So at the end, uh, we took the metal and, uh, and I decided to cook it anyway in a very different way. So we put all the, all the wood that we had left uh, from the constructions or, or, and, uh, and we did this experiment that it, it, it came a beautiful piece. That is this one. It's, but you can see it's not completely cooked, and it's going to be dissolved on t t through, through times. So we don't know for how long or anything like that. But I will try again until it's possible to make it. So you can see. But it's beautiful. Be I think it's even more beautiful the, the 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 accident and the passing of the water and how it begins to dissolve. No, it has this essence of this kind of monoliths. No, that, uh, maybe an, maybe. In, 2,000 years, somebody will arrive there and say, well, there was an, there was an ancient culture <laughs> living here, no? So you see the, the burnings and... I mean, I love this kind of accidents and... Uh, you see the, the, the quantity of clay that we use for, the, for that uh, piece. And then now we're doing these ones that are 80 by 80 by 100 and uh, like five feet tall. That we're still drying and we, we don't know if we're gonna be successful, but I want to do someday an installation of 20 of those ones. And then uh, one day uh, when we were doing the, we tried to do a one meter by one meter that we were not successful. And I decided to cut it with a chainsaw. Also not following the, the codes of, uh, of, uh, how say, of uh, security. It's, it's funny because when I posted in Instagram, I mean, still everybody telling me, wow, what about what's telling me? You, 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 you're a very bad example. You should be using uh, boots, special boots and, uh, and gloves. And so, so this become a much more sculptural work. I mean, in, in this case, I have much more control because with the chainsaw, it's like a rock, so in order to, to do one, we have to spend like 
20 or 30 chains. But then you can shape it much more. It's much more a sculptural work that I'm much more involved in the outcome. And it has a lot of details that they are more human, more, more non-natural. You see them here? And here it's very interesting because in this case, we use the wood. One family member is doing a construction of a wood cabin close by. And we use the treated wood to burn. So it got much more smoke. I mean, there are much more smoke. I don't know how to say it in English. It's a beautiful outcome, too. And then I have, every time there, there is some uh, uh, clay left, I, I like to do these balls. Mm -hmm. That in a way, they are, resemble a little bit the Lucio Fontana, I know that we were talking. Uh, and I'm gonna use them for my next show. I'm, I'm gonna talk about it later. Okay, here we come to another part. When I was doing the, well, I began to do this kind of a, a clay bricks that I designed that are uh, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 50 centimeters. And when we were doing them at, at, at my studio in, in Casa Wabi, one day uh, when the craftsman that helped me to do them uh, stacked them, they stacked them uh, no, no, by any preconceived idea, they stacked them as a as a wall in my studio, just just because it was the easiest way to stack them. And then talking to them, sometimes I take a beer with them or or something. They were, I realized that all of them they were illegal immigrants at one time in in United States, and the young ones they have they still have this dream of coming here and and, and make some money. And that was the political times of uh, of, of the election of president. And I decided to do this, this wall made by Mexicans, with Mexican soul, with Mexican for the, the four elements of Mexico, and to bring it to the United States the same way as the illegal immigrants come. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and when we were thinking where to put them, we decided to put it in Washington Square Park, that this has been like the flag of the U2 movement and, and uh, uh, gay parades and stuff like that. So what we did is we did this this wall of uh, in feet is like seven feet by twenty eight feet long, and in the, we install it in the morning. Uh, we install it uh, uh, early in the morning. We leave it from uh, we, we we begin at six. We finish like nine or ten. Then we leave it until three o'clock uh, for people to see it as a public art sculpture. And then what we did is after three o'clock. Everybody was able to take one brick away. Anybody that was passing by was not focused on the art world or, or, or collectors. Everybody, and each each brick had my my seal with my name. And uh, and as the process is so random, each brick is unique. Some of them they're more beautiful than other ones, or some of them they're more beautiful uh, for me, or but, but not for other people. And each people we give them a bag, and they were able to take the brick away. So the concept was that how you can assemble the wall in one day, and the same day can be disassembled. Same thing, how the, when society gets together, they can dis, uh, dismantle any kind of wall, either political, either uh, gender, either economical. So it was a very beautiful metaphor of, of, of life. And it was a, when I arrived at three o'clock, I was expecting people, but there was like eight blocks of people making a line to, to help to dismantle the, the wall and to take a brick uh, home, as you can see. And we just left one brick. I, I wanted just to leave one brick there for the rest of the night. I'm, I'm sure that somebody took it when I left, but like the, the concept. It was very beautiful. And uh, um, when we were doing the, um, the installation, this school of young kids of eight years old to 10 years old, they were watching there and drawing the, the wall. And they were eager to touch and to help, so I invited them to help. It was not planned on the on the on the script of the how we were going to do it, 
And then at night, all of them, they came with their parents to keep, get one brick. But then, like, two months later, I received uh, letters from, from, one letter from each kid with a drawing and the concept. And it was so beautiful, the interpretation of the kids, because it was not fucking so, 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 so political as, as I, I thought. It was much more about uh, simple uh, barriers or simple walls that the kids have, no? So it's a very beautiful and poetic piece. Then we made it in London in September. Uh, that was also very beautiful and also talk with a, li a little bit different context of Brexit and was during the day of the gay parade. But I like a lot this concept also of, the, of, the, of, a, of a, how a, a sculpture can be changing so fast. So then after this, I, I begin to do these cubes of two meters by two meters by two, seven feet by seven feet by seven feet and begin to play with these kind of timbers, well, clay timbers, I call them, in different ways. I glaze with gold, some of them. And then I came with this idea. Um, my gallery of, with my gallery of Japan, we decided to put a, a clay cube of two meters by two meters, and then with the same concept to invite people to take one brick away in order to make a sculpture that was changing every day, that was beautiful. It, uh, and for Japanese, that they created this game called Jenga, I don't know if you have. So instead of having an order, they begin to pull them out in different ways, you see? So it's a living sculpture that is changing day by day. And for me, each, each day it's completely beautiful. And uh, this was here at the Nasher, no? I mean, in a very different context and with very, very, very good companions. <laughs> that was the one in London. That was one that we did uh, um, uh, in Belgium. And you see the bricks. Those are, those are the clay cubes of 80 by 80. In different contexts. Okay, and then I came with the idea of doing this pavilion in, um, in my foundation, Casa Wabi. So I wanted to do 64 cubes of two meters by two meters by two meters in this, in the, in this uh, concrete uh, base. And, um, and the concept was to, to live in them forever. And, and, uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, there, there is a cube I show you, the one I, I did, the two by two, the one I burned. And here it's 64 cubes. It's, there are more than 800 tons of clay and uh, that's 1,600 pounds, more or less. And I begin to do it. I have been working. It's my biggest art project ever. And uh, we have been working on it for two years and a half or something like that. And uh, just yesterday, we finished the last one. And so we, we, you have a very fresh video that they, I just got like 11, 10 o'clock in the morning here of the piece completely finished. I was not able to, to, to put the last brick, but. And it's a living sculpture for people to walk all, uh, inside and, uh, and it will be, I mean, even some parts already have some plants growing and uh, The shadows change every day, so it's, it's also a, a, a light sculpture, too. But I want them someday to become completely organic, round. Uh, Depending on the time of the day, they change completely. And I mean, there is, there is a lot of sand there because 
we need a lot of cars to bring the the bricks. But the, I mean, I hope like in next rainy season it will be all green. <coughs> well, the whole point of the work, as, as you can see, it's to challenge the, the materials, to look for new recipes, to embrace uh, change, uh, to experiment. Um, when I did, when I give talks to art students, I told them that the, 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 the thing that you can learn the most is from the accidents that happened at the studio. Uh, if, you, if you follow a single formula, you will always have the same outcome. So as far as you, you're, you allow the accidents and you allow the uh, new things, the world will evolve and it will be changing constantly, no? And I think that's the fun part as an artist. Uh, um, I, I didn't study art. My, I'm dyslexic, I, I'm hyperactive, I have deficit of attention, so I, I'm very imperfect. And, and my mother put me, since I was very young, in these classes, like uh, very Montessori focus of art, just to, as a therapy. And, uh, and that's why, for me, it's, it's, I, I make art or I make work because it's essential for me for my uh, integrity of a, as a human and to, to be able to co coexist with other people. Um, And let me tell you a little bit about the foundation. This is a foundation that I did uh, four years ago. Uh, I think uh, uh, an obligation of an artist, uh, I don't know how, how many of you are involved in the art world, but the art world has changed a lot. There is a lot of money involved, a lot of uh, very cold things. And I think the obligation of an artist is to be socially engaged. And, and, and uh, when I begin to do well uh, after very difficult years, uh, the prices of the works and everything, they're unlogical, completely unlogical. And, and I decided I wanted to give one big part of what I was owning, uh, get, uh, uh, getting, to my fellow artists, to Mexico, and to the communities, that, uh, the pure communities uh, uh, in the coast of Oaxaca. So I decided to do this foundation, and I did it with a an architect, Japanese architect named Tadao Ando. Uh, and with this, this uh, it's an art resident see that we invite six artists at a time. We pay for everything, we don't ask them for nothing. The only thing we ask them is to do a very strong uh, project with the local communities. And they can stay for one month to three months. Then we also have an exhibition space that we do uh, one show a year of a very well-known artist that stays for one year. Then we have a mobile library that goes to all the 14 communities around it. And then we have a clay pavilion also made by one of the most important architects, uh, Alvaro Sisa, that we invite three classrooms a week. They come, they do clay with the artists. Then we show them the exhibition. They, they, we show them all the pavilions. Then we, sh we, we have a small movie theater that we put the movie with content for the kids. So we make them like a very special day for them. And, uh, and it has been a game changer in the, in the local communities. Really, I, I think uh, um, that in the long time, it's going to change a lot of that area. Um, and then, last but not least, this is a new series that I'm working now. That is the first time I mix two colors. And uh, last year, uh, unfortunately, my grandmother passed away that I, I it was the most important, bueno, the first uh, loss that I have that I feel so strong. I mean, I had other losses that were very sad. But I'm on the, I'm maybe on the, I'm 47 year old, years old, I'm on the middle age crisis, or I don't know how you call it. <laughs> but I begin to think about, I have three kids, and I begin to think about a lot of about death and, and, and life, uh, getting old, uh, the, seeing how my kids, they were so young, how past be, be, begin to pass so fast, and about, about the duality. And I wanted to do this series talking about duality, about light and darkness, body and soul. So I begin to, I decided to do this series of black and white paintings, that they're always like fighting the black and the white to, 
to see which one will be the winner, no? And I, well, I like to think that the, in real life the white will be the, the winner, no? So it's, that's a new series that I'm going to present in, the, in January in my gallery in London and in Mexico. Uh, but it's, it's, it's about that, uh, about talking about duality, the passing of life, and this constant fight that we have every day in different dualities. No? That's the studio in New York. And two paintings. But you see how, and I mean, obviously they are completely organic and with non control. You see how the black tries to invade the white, no? and the white has this resistance to get invaded, and that's life. No? And that's all. Do you have a quick question? Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really excellent. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, just first a quick one. I wonder if any of this material, particularly the film about the firing of the cube, if those are available online, because I would love to show my students. Yes, yeah, they're available on Vimeo. On Vimeo. Great, thank you. Uh, my other question is, um, I'm, as I see this, I'm, I'm thinking of artists like Mikhail Barcelo, or Nishida June, or even at the end there, Pierre Soulage. So I wonder if you could talk about some of the artists that, uh, that, that you feel uh, some commonality with, artists working today or artists of the past. Okay, yes. Um, well, when I took my first step to be a professional artist, uh, my wife, uh, uh, I almost steal it from my father's-in-law. My father-in-law that he was op opposed to my marriage, we're good friends now, but uh, he asked me, uh, when we sit to negotiate the whole thing, uh, he asked me, well, please, I just want her to finish school and to finish uh, a master's degree that she wants to do. And I said, of course. No, it's... So she decided that she wanted to go, uh, she chose three, three places to do her master's degree. And one was Barcelona. And obviously, as you can see, I'm, I'm a big, big fan of uh, Anthony Tapies. Um, that Barcelona has a lot of influence from Tapies. And we decided to go to Barcelona because I also I was very attracted, not just to Tapies, but the, to the informalism that was created in, in, in Barcelona. And I, I, I got the, the big opportunity also by chance, and chance to meet Tapies and to be at his home. So, so I, I, my work has a lot of influence of this kind of artist, informal, as we can call also uh, some of the art, the povera artists and, uh, and um, and um, land art artist. But one of the artists that I, I, I'm, I'm very open in, in uh, my spectrum for art, for music or for cinema or for architecture, is very open. Eh? I'm, I'm, I don't like to be in one set, but I love the minimalist artist. I love the land art artist. I love uh, uh, the, the, art, the abstract expressionist. But I also love a, 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 like a lot of conceptual art. But I mean, the, if, I can, if I was able to collect I would love to have a, 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 a Tapies or a Miró or a Richard Serra, eh, or Walter de Maria. Eh, Miquel, I know him well, and, and I'm, I have been lucky enough to show sometimes with him. I think he's a great artist. And, uh, and Solange, uh, I, I, I love Solange, actually. I just uh, signed with a gallery that represents him, too. And I love his, his work, too. But, uh, I'm very open to, to that. Uh, well, I'm very, very influenced by the informalist, the abstract, infor sorry, the, the uh, Catalan informalist, and by the land art. Great. Is there another question? Um, ripped these families apart, and they are having real 
psychological terror um, effects on these children. I'm wondering if these policies have an effect on your view of the performance um, since these policies came into effect after the performance of the wall and um, how you would like us to maybe talk about these policies in uh, reference to your wall when it's on view in the gallery here. Yeah, so I mean, of course, they have a lot of, uh, of uh, new lectures to the, to, to the wall, no? But, I mean, at the end, the wall was, is, means division, no? Everywhere, no? I mean, the, 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 at the beginning of the humans, the, the, there were not walls, no? So a wall means division, and, and division, the only f thing that has carry for our uh, society is it's wars and... and, and uh, <laughs> And bad things. I mean, I, I think that we are so evolved that it should, we should be united, and, and there is a single world, and whatever happens in one place is the same. I mean, we're human beings, all connected. Uh, obviously, this kind of uh, performance they get different le le lectures depending on the on the on, on the time they are. No, I mean, I think it's a, a completely dis disgrace. I think you said uh, this thing happening to young kids, to young. I mean, no, nobody deserves that. No. And, and, uh, but at, at the end, I think also that uh, the universe is very savvy. I don't know how to say savvy in English. Uh, wise. And whoever is doing this is going to get punished, no? Either here or in another world. It's not logical, no? I mean, it's the essence of, of man is to take care of, his, of men. But at the end, uh, like I say in, in the... In the, this series of the duality, I, I think why we always prevail, no? Great, do we have another one for the audience? Yeah, uh, so, oh, so what, uh, why uh, Oaxaca, and like why the Puerto Escondido, which I know is where your, <laughs> your studio is and your foundation, what attracted you to that area? Um, because I, I, I believe a lot in, 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 I mean, my grandfather, my grandfather and all his, his, I mean, they come from Oaxaca, but I was born and my father was born in, in, in Mexico City, but, and I begin to do, to go camping in Puerto Escondido when, since I was 12 years old, and I, I always feel this special energy. I don't know if it's true or it's not true. I believe on those things, but I believe like, like, like home in, in, in Oaxaca. And that's why I decided to do there. Also, it's one of the poorest states in Mexico, the one who needs most, 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 most help. And that's what I decided to do too. But it's funny because uh, we go a lot to Japan and, and uh, we conceive our third uh, son in, in Japan, Alvaro. And it, I don't know if it's because, but he, every, he go, we go a lot to, to Tokyo. And the one that feels like home and it's, it's, it's Alvaro. I don't know. If, I'm sure that the, when 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 the, uh, hum, human life is cre in, on creation on the on the belly of a, of the mother, the energy of the place uh, marks a lot, and and affects the the, the outcome of the cells you know, growing, and I mean uh, that has happened to anybody that you feel like there are places that you feel like home and maybe you have never been there, you know, like, and I believe in that kind of energy. We appreciate you all coming today, and we invite you to continue the conversation out in our lower landing, where we have wine waiting for all of you. Thank you for coming today. Thank you so much.